All right. So we are going to finish up chapter two with talking about carbon. And carbon is a very special molecule. It's a special cat because it can carry four bonds. It has four electrons in its outer valence shell. And the octet rule or the rule of eight says that we want either eight or a full valence electric electron shell to be happy. Um, carbon has four, which means it takes four bonds to get to that maximum stability. And the fact that carbon can maintain four bonds gives it a lot of versatility. Um, it's found in all living things. It's found in the Earth's crust. It's found in the atmosphere. It's found everywhere. Um, those four electron shell or four electrons, um, those four valence electron spots that get to be filled with bonds means that uh, carbon can form very large and complex molecules. They can form long chains, right? So long chains, and they can also form rings. Oops. When you when you get into organic chemistry, you learn how to draw hexagons. All right, um, and they do that by by bonding to each other using covalent bonds. So this carbon is sharing, and since this is a single line, this carbon is sharing one electron pair with each other. All right, um, carbon is the basis of organic chemistry. Organic chemistry just simply means that we're studying molecules that have carbon as the central element. Um, when we talk about life on planet Earth, we're talking about organic life, organic uh, carbon-based life forms. So carbon is extremely important to life on Earth. So let's just get in and talk about the basics of carbon and the, and the structures that it can make so that when we get to um, macromolecules, we have a better understanding of what's going on. So let's start with hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons are literally made up of hydrogen and carbon. So only hydrogen and carbon come together to make these hydrocarbons. They can be very different in size and shape. They could be long chains um, to single carbon compounds such as this methane that you see here. So you can have long chains of carbon molecules and each of those carbons are gonna have hydrogens coming off the side. So on and so forth. All right. Um, the suffixes in the names of your hydrocarbons identify the number of carbon-carbon bonds. So the bonds between each of your carbons. If you have a single bond between your carbons, like that, you have an ane. If you have a double bond, like this, you have an ene. And if you have a triple bond, like this, you have an i. All right. So this is just some examples of methanes and ethanes are going to have single carbon bonds right here and your central carbon right there and a double bond is going to give you the ethene right now carbon is really interesting um we get well the thing that we have to remember is that carbon has four bonds the thing that we always have to remember when we go through carbon will bond four times, okay? So these are covalent bonds. So for each bond, we are sharing a pair of electrons, all right? So if you have a single bond between two carbons, all right, that's one bond. That means there's a hydrogen here, there's a hydrogen here, there's a hydrogen here. One, two, three, four. This one, four bonds. So one, two, three, four. All right? If you have carbons that are double bonded together, remember they can only hold four bonds. So there's one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Okay? You have carbons that are triple bonded together. One, two, three, right there. Each of them are only going to be able to have one hydrogen because the max number of bonds carbon can hold is four. So one, two, three, four. All right. That's what we got to keep in mind when we're talking about carbon. Carbon 
Um, and hydrocarbons can come in straight chains, such as the propane that you see here. These are single bonded hydrocarbons. All right, so this carbon right here will have one, two, three, four bonds to it. All right, so carbons are not only leaking to other carbons, but they can also leak to those hydrogens, and that's what makes a hydrocarbon. Carbon makes something called isomers, and isomers are molecules that have the same chemical formula but differ in spatial arrangements around that central carbon. So same formula, different shapes. Okay, and that is important because uh, molecules not only have specific atoms and elements that combine together to build those molecules, but the way those, mole those atoms and elements are combined together give the molecules specific shapes. And molecule shape is extremely important when you're talking about things like protein function and the way our cells can signal each other. So molecular shape plays a big role in life. If you have a structural isomer, also known as a constitutional isomer, the same atoms are there, but they connect differently. So you might have this, like three, four, or you might have one, two, three, four. So they are same atoms, but this one has a, this shape and connection, and this one has this shape and connection. Stereoisomers, um, same atoms and same connectivity, but then different shape. So you can have um, different arrangements around a double bond, and we'll kind of talk about this, right? So that would be an example of a molecule. Two, three, all right? So same atoms and same connectivity, so we're gonna have the same shape, right? But the difference is, so we're all connected the same, but the difference might be um, where the arrangement is, okay? And then you can have enantiomers that are mirror images of each other. So the central carbon is the same, but the they're mirror image of each other. So you can have a left and a right, okay? So they're arranged the same way, they're just mirror imaged across that plane, right there. All right, so this is a great flow chart that just kind of breaks them and then gives you examples of each type of isomer, that's why I included it, um, just because it was a great way to see them all at the same time. So structural isomers, um, if you remember, structural isomers have the same atoms and different connectivity. So describe the difference between these two models. So this is your door of the Explorer moment where I ask you a question, you think about it, we'll pause, and then we'll talk about it some more. So how are these two molecules different? Okay, so we have the same same carbons, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Same hydrogens, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. The difference in these two are the way that they're connected. So different connectivity. So straight line, and then we're connected differently. Okay? Our next type is uh, our... Um, diostereomers. Um, they are same atoms, same connectivity, different shape. So same atoms, we're connecting the same way, we're different shape. So you have C, C, they're connected together the same. C, C, connected together the same. Each carbon has a chlorine and a hydrogen. Each carbon has a chlorine and a hydrogen. Same way over here. We have a chlorine and a hydrogen, right? We have a chlorine and a hydrogen, so they are connected together. They have the same atoms, the same connectivity, but they have a different shape. And the cis version, cis, all right, the chlorines are on the same side, right? 
And on the cis version, the hydrogens are on the same side. Now on the trans version, trans are hydrogens are on opposite sides and our chlorines are on opposite sides. So we're connected the same, connected the same. We have the same atoms. They are just arranged differently in space. They're shaped differently. All right. So look really hard on this one because we have our, our question coming up. Which molecule below is a polar molecule? Now remember, we got to go back to that last lecture. Polar molecules. Polar molecules, the electrons are unequally shared. All right. A nonpolar molecule, they're shared equally. So the charge is the same in a polar molecule you have a slightly positive and a slightly negative side all right so which molecule below is polar which molecule below are you going to have a slightly positive side and a slightly negative side All right, if you answered this one, you are correct. That one is gonna be polar. Why? Because you're gonna have charges here. Let's say the green is positive, all right? And, or actually, the green's chlorine is negative, but it doesn't matter. Um, so positive, and let's say this is negative, just for grins. This one's positive, negative, negative, positive. When you go here, like if we put a pretend line right through the middle of this, this molecule right here has a positive side and a negative side. This molecule right here has a positive and a negative side. That's going to make it polar. This molecule right here, it has the same charges. You have a positive and a negative on top and a positive and negative on bottom, so that's going to be polar. So this one is cis- and this one is trans. Okay, questions on that one? I guess you can't ask me questions. This is my habit from being in the class, right? I make sure my kids know what's going on before we move on to the next section. I guess if you have questions, you can shoot me an email or message me on Remind. Um, that will work. Um, so this is an example where you would see cis and trans in quote unquote real life. Um, this is an example of a fatty acid. Fatty acids are, tight, are parts of lipids. Okay. In a uh, saturated fat, all of your uh, carbons are filled up with hydrogens and the fatty acid is in a straight line. All right. In an unsaturated fat, and we'll talk more about this and macromolecules. You have a double bond, and that double bond would be right there. Okay, and that what that double bond does is it limits the amount of rotation that atoms have. So they can't rotate as well around a double bond as they can with a single bond. All right? So if you have a single bond, right, those, those atoms can just spin all day, okay? But if you have a double bond, it's harder. It's like if you're dancing. If you're connected to your partner with just one hand holding one hand, right, you can just spin around each other all day. You can do um, twirls and all that stuff all day long. But when you are both holding each both of each other's hands so both hands are extended and your partner is grasping those both hands and you try to do a twist it's harder because both people in that dance have to lift those arms up 
and then twist underneath those arms and come back down. So it's harder to twist around a double bond than it is a single bond. So what this, what this results in is this kinked shape, right? Where you see a bend. And we'll talk more about what this means for fats later, but this is an example of a, a trans um, isomer. Enantiomers are your mirrors. Okay, enantiomers are your mirrors, your left and rights. So if you were to put like a mirror right here, these are mirror images of each other. CH3 here, CH3 here, hydrogen's here, okay? So this would be the same as saying one is here, two is here, right? Three, four, five, okay? If I read this hand from left to right, it's five, four, three, two, one. If I read this hand from left to right, it's one, two, three, four, five. They're mirror images of each other. We see this a lot with medicines. Um, sometimes medicines can be shaped uh, left versus right, and they can have different actions depending if they're left or right. Okay, so um, only the left-handed forms of this particular amino acid are used to make proteins. So this right here is used to make proteins, but this molecule right here can't be used just because it's shaped different, because it's gonna fit into that puzzle piece a little bit different. Carbon um, can come in rings. We talked about, we've talked a lot about carbon chains, but carbon can come in rings. Um, when, we, when we look at carbon in rings, we have to learn how to read these molecules. Remember that carbon um, will only hold four bonds. So there's your carbon and there's one, two, three, four. Okay, and that gives us different structures and different um, molecules can attach. Like this one right here has all hydrogens attached to it. This one right here has a hydroxide attached to it um, and a carboxyl attached to it. So they can have different things attaching to it and the different functional groups that will attach to it will give it different functions. You can see um, on these on these rings, how the number of bonds between your carbons determines the number of hydrogens that combine to that carbon. Um, and you can see that they don't all necessarily have to be completely made of carbon. You can have other elements here. Like this one has a nitrogen in it. Um, this one has a carbon or an oxygen in the ring. So, um, one other thing that I want to make sure and show you before we move on is that when we do these diagrams, we don't always necessarily draw the carbons. So sometimes just the diagrams themselves will be implied. So every time you see a corner here, that's a carbon. Okay, you might draw it like this. Okay, so you see those carbons are implied. If you get a ring like this, you know that that's not a carbon because they physically wrote in that nitrogen. And remember, carbon bonds how many times? Four. So this carbon right here has one, one, and two bonds on it already. So we can add two hydrogens to that carbon and fill that sucker out. All right, so how many carbons are found in the compound above? Knowing what we know from our previous diagrams, how many carbons are found above? All right, here we go. There's a carbon here. There's a carbon here. There's a carbon here. Here here and here. So one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. All right, now the things that get attached to molecules, especially to those carbon molecules, such as this one, 
and such as this one, all right, are called functional groups. And functional groups are groups of atoms that will give certain properties to carbon-based molecules. Depending on what prop what um, functional group is going to be added to it, it can make carbon-based uh, carbon-based molecules act in different ways. For instance, some functional groups can make a molecule more acidic. Some functional groups can make it more basic. Some functional groups can make it nonpolar. Some functional groups can make them polar. And so depending on the combination of functional groups, you can add specific properties to those molecules. They can, they can confer those properties to the molecules. Um, a lot of times it can be a charge um, or polarity. Um, it can change their bonding capacity. So by adding that functional group, we can no longer bond um, certain ways. And there are seven main ones that we're going to talk about here. Uh, change in a functional group can change the property of a molecule. So if you look at the top molecule, that's ethane. Ethane is a flammable gas. So we have carbon, carbon attached. And you have six hydrogens. One, two, three, four, five, six attached. Okay. Now, this one at the bottom is ethyl alcohol. Now, ethyl alcohol is drinking alcohol. So the consumable al alcohol. Now, we still have two carbons bonded to each other, but instead of having six hydrogens, we only have five, three, four, five, and we have a different functional group here called a hydroxide. And just the difference in this one functional group is the difference between a flammable gas and a drinking beverage, All right? So when we look at these, we can see the different properties that are um, conferred here. So which of these two molecules, compounds, is polar? Now remember, polar is unequal charge. Nonpolar, oops, that's not how you spell nonpolar. has the same charge. So which one's polar and which one's nonpolar? Okay, if you said that this one was polar, you are correct. All right, so the reason it's polar is because we have this hydroxide. All of these hydrogens are gonna give you the same charge. The hydroxide is gonna be different. This one is nonpolar because all of these hydrogens are gonna give you the same charge around it, okay? So it's going to be an equal charge all the way around this molecule, as opposed to the one at the bottom. So these are the different functional groups. When you see an R, so R right here, that is implying where you would attach to your carbon molecule, all right? So there is some sort of carbon structure, could be a chain or could be a ring, at that R. You with me? So this one right here, uh, O bonded to an H is a hydroxyl. It makes uh, molecules more polar. Methyl is a CH3. CH3 is going to be like this, right? And you can see why this would be nonpolar, because you have those hydrogens distributed equally. This one's a carbonyl with an N, and it's literally just a C double bond O. So you have a carbon here, and you have carbons here, and then you have your C double bond O. And it's going to make it polar, because that, that oxygen has more electronegativity, and it's going to uh, pull those electrons. All right? This one is carboxyl with an OX. Um, it has your central carbon. It has a C double bond O, just like your carbonyl does. So C double bond O. The difference is you have an OH here. Okay? So that OH, um, in addition to the C double bond O, makes it a carboxyl. All right? 
So if it is like this, C double bond O, C, OH, that is not a carboxyl. That does not a carboxyl make. When the, the oxygen and the hydroxide, the OH, are attached to the same carbon, then you have a carboxyl. So we're going to erase this. All right? An amino is really easy to remember. It's the only one with a nitrogen. So the only one that you are going to see um, on this PowerPoint slide with a nitrogen is an amino. It's an, a nitrogen with an H, with two H's on it. You see those in amino acids, all right? Um, they, they will remove hydrogens from the solutions they're in. So since they're reducing the amount of hydrogens, they consider it makes the solution basic because it's pulling out those hydrogens. Um, phosphate is another easy one to remember. It's your only P on your list of functional groups um, that we're talking about today. So that only the one with the phosphorus is phosphate in the same way with sulfohydryl. It's the only S. So these three that you see right now, pretty easy to remember. N is amino, P is phosphate, S is sulfohydryl. What you have to remember about these is OH is hydroxyl, CH3 is methyl, C double bond O is carbonyl, C double bond O, OH is carboxyl. Okay, so flipping back and forth, you're welcome to flip back and forth because it's important to use our resources as we're learning. Identify the hydroxyl. All right, so let's flip back. Hydroxyl is OH. Now, let's look at this. This is your hydroxyl. Now, why isn't it this one? Okay. This hydrox this OH right here is part of a bigger functional group. C double bond O with an OH off the same carbon is a carboxyl. All right, identify the amino. Amino is one of the ones that's easy because it has the N. Amino has the N. This right here is your amino. All right, identify the carboxyl. This should be easy since we just talked about it. Carboxyl. This is your carboxyl. All right. So this looks like we're at the end of this particular week two, chapter two lecture. Um, I know that it covers a lot of information and there's a lot of time in these notes. Use them um, in any way that you feel see, feel see fit to use them. Pardon me, see fit to use them. If you have any questions, as always, you can shoot me an email or message me on Remind. I am 